The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Well, good afternoon and welcome along to The Profile. I'm Justin Briley, your host for today's edition of the programme that brings you a significant person in the world of Christian ministry, talks to them about their life and faith journey. It brought to you in association with Premier Christianity magazine. I'm the editor of that monthly title. And if you want to find more interviews with leading Christians from around the world, then why not visit our website? premierchristianity.com and add slash free sample to be able to find a free sample copy of the magazine. Well, I'm very excited about my guest today. She's someone I've long wanted to talk to and it's a delight to have her in the studio with me. Becky Pippert is an international speaker, author and evangelist who for decades has been helping Christians find the confidence to share their faith effectively. Her book, Out of the Salt Shaker into the World, was an international bestseller when she wrote it, I think in her late 20s. Well, since then, she's raised a family, established an evangelistic ministry both in the USA and Europe, and continues to write and produce resources. Most recently, Empowered, which is a training course in evangelism. You can also find her Seeker Bible Study Guides and Discipleship course for every stage of Christian development called Live, Grow, Know at her website. Good place to find out more about her too. BeckyPippert.com. Becky, welcome along to the program. Thank you so much. I've been wanting to meet you as well. (laughs) Well, the feeling is mutual. Um, (laughs) Becky, we like on the profile to go right back to the beginning. Mm. Now, you didn't grow up in a Christian home, did you? No, that's right. I I was the first person to become a Christian. uh, And though it took a long time, Eventually, every member of my family came to the Lord, but wow. it took a long time. Okay. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't raised a Christian, but I did start as as most young people do. I think I was a teenager when I began really asking the big questions and began struggling with: Is it possible to know if there is a God? And one of the things that was a particular problem for me is I thought: How is it possible? To know if there's a God, to know there is an an absolute truth. Mm. When we are limited, finite creatures, how could any limited, finite creature say, oh, I I found it out. I know exactly. Mm. You know, there is a God. I thought that just sounded like such hubris. (laughs) How could you say that? So that was my dilemma. How did you resolve that dilemma? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm at home. It's in the spring. I am from my family of south of Chicago, and I'm in the the back garden, and I'm lying out in the grass, and I was just watching, you know, looking at the flowers, and then started noticing these ants, and these ants were so busy building little ant mounds, and I watched them, and they were so industrious (laughs) and so busy, and they hadn't the slightest idea I was there. And I thought, isn't that amazing? These ants haven't the slightest clue I am there. And so I remember taking some leaves and some twigs and moving what they were doing, interrupting what they were doing. And they bounced off the little branch or twig and immediately started building another mound. I thought, this is, I'm changing the course of their history. Mm -hmm. And they have no idea that I am there. About that time, two ants crawled on my hand. And I looked at those two ants, and I remember thinking, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be amazing if one ant said to the other ant, do you believe in Becky? <laughs> and one ant said, I don't believe Becky. That's a myth. <laughs> it's a fairy tale. And we're all there is. And they're literally in my hand. Mm. I could blow that ant mm. off my hand, you know, so easily. The other ant said, no, I believe there's a Becky. I believe there's <laughs> order in the universe. I believe in Becky. And I thought, but how would you know either? Mm. I mean, how would you know I'm there? Then my mind started racing. What would I do if I wanted to truly communicate who I am what I'm like. And I remember my mind just raced to one thing after another after another. And then it was like a sledgehammer when it came to me. There is only one way. The only way they would ever know that I exist is if I became an ant. 
And then I thought, yeah, but that's a problem. Because if I became an aunt, they'd obviously say, how would they know I'm, I'm mm-hmm. also Becky? And I thought, well, you'd have to do tricks. You'd have to do <laughs> things no other aunt could do. And I remember thinking that I'd never read one page of the Bible. But because I had been in a very academic high school, I became very interested. I was, you know, asking a lot of questions. So I read um, all of the major religions and mm-hmm. read the religious texts of major religions except Christianity. I thought, yeah, well, I've been raised in America, mm-hmm. you know. And even though I was an agnostic, I, if you had said, hey, are you a Christian? My understanding of Christianity was just being a nice person. Mm. So I would have said, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a God, but yeah, I probably am a Christian. I'm nice. Mm. <laughs> you <know? Yeah>. So <laughs> you, Lewis says Christianity used to be understood as a noun. Now it's become an adjective. Yes. And that's exactly, I was an <laughs> adjective. You know. So anyway, I'm going, okay, um, you know, how would they know? I'd have to become an aunt. I'd have to do things no other aunt could do. And because I had studied other religions without Christianity, I thought, but no other religion I know says that. Mm. They don't say that something from the outside came in. And I thought, wow, this is absolutely amazing because it just solved my problem of how can a finite, limited creature know absolute truth? They can't. They can't say, well, just keep trying harder, and one day you'll be God, mm. or one day you will know everything. If it isn't revealed, I, I, then how are we ever going to know? And then I thought, I wonder if Jesus thought he came from the outside. I wonder if he thought that that he came from the outside and came to reveal who God is. Now, I'd never read the Bible. I didn't know anything about Christianity. But you'd effectively stumbled across the doctrine of the incarnation exactly. by, by looking at these ants. Exactly. Mm. So I went, okay, and tell you the truth, the experience was frightening mm. because I felt that there was something driving my thoughts that wasn't me. And so I stood up and I went, all right, I've never read the Bible. I'm going to go read the Bible. And I'm going to look in my parents' library and either get a Bible or get any book with the word Christianity in the title. Came into the library. We had no Bible. And so I went, all right, is there any book on Christianity? And literally, I remember going through, you know, just so, so many uh, Mm. books in, in, in the library. And it was right at the end. I went, ah, This is the only book that has Christian or Christianity in the title. I took it off the shelf, blew off the dust, and went, well, who has ever heard of a weird title like this? Mere Christianity by (laughs) C.S. Lewis. Someone had given it to my mother. It had never been read. I sat down, and I, my first exposure to Christianity was reading C.S. Lewis. Well, all I can say is, thank God for that person who gave your mother that book. No kidding. No kidding. Because I was arrogant and thinking, you know, so typical 17, 18 year old. And I thought, oh, how could anybody believe in a closed system? How could anybody Mm. believe in one particular religion? You'd have to be an idiot. And now I'm confronted with this brilliant mind, with somebody who wasn't a Christian, you know, in his Mm. uh, former Mm. years, didn't come to faith until he was, uh, I think, in his 30s. That's right. And so, so I was amazed. He gave me the landscape. And I really had one question. Did God come to earth through someone? Because I understood you had to identify, you had to be human, but you also would have to be God. Exactly the doctrine of the incarnation. Mm. And so I read the book. I was deeply affected by the book. And then I thought, all right, I've got to get a Bible. So I went out, bought a Bible. I can remember the chair I was sitting in. I can remember the room I was in. And I started, I think I started with the Gospel of John. Maybe I started with Luke, Mm. but I knew I had to read a Gospel. Nothing could have prepared me for what Jesus was like. So beautiful, so radical, so controversial. I mean, you think about this. Here he is, the Lord of Lords, the Mm -hmm. King of Kings. What was the primary criticism of Jesus? by the religious. He didn't seem religious enough. Mm. Now, do you know how much that appeals (laughs) to an agnostic seeker like me? 
And I thought, oh, my goodness, why didn't anybody tell me this is what Jesus mm. was like? And so it took more time than, than you know, it, I had quite a few more experiences. But that is what led me to fully embrace Christ. What an amazing way in which you, you had this intellectual journey, right. a very introspective one initially, yeah. but that led you to C.S. Lewis, miraculously almost. Miraculously, definitely. And, and, and I guess looking back, you can see the way that God was very much active. The Holy Spirit was active in, in prompting you and, and kind of leading you towards what would become your faith. Do you know something? When I went to my 25th high school uh, reunion a while ago, <laughs> And so many, uh, yeah, I hadn't seen them. I, it was Champaign High School, mm. Champaign-Urbana is my hometown. I can't tell you how many, particularly women, came up to me and said, oh, Becky, our church is reading your stuff. We did out of the salt mm. shaker. We're doing your seeker Bible studies or whatever. And I went, oh, my goodness, you're a Christian? Oh, I, I was raised a Christian. I was a Christian when we were in high school. <laughs> I said, why didn't you tell me? Wow. And they said, oh, Becky, if I ever met anybody that didn't look the type, it was you. <laughs> I said, come on. What do you mean? And they said, oh, you were always asking these big questions, you know, to the teacher. And I can remember when something came up about Christianity and you were quite cynical and you were just very extroverted and seemed very happy. I said, I was desperate. Mm. I was desperate. I so longed to know truth that it, it really almost became a crisis. Right. And they said, ah, I am so sorry, but I just never dreamed that you were open or interested. So you don't <laughs> make that mistake. I had to find the Lord all by myself. Goodness me. Well, I want to talk later on about y the experiences you've had and, and the kind of fears that I think your friends evidently had about sharing their faith right. and so on, because that's certainly what you've devoted a lot of your ministry and time to. I just want to kind of finish the story a little bit, though, about how, what happened with your parents. You know, this was a long journey. It was a long journey. My mother believed there was something up there somewhere. My dad was an atheist. And my mother, and so I, I did begin sharing my faith. And I learned very quickly not to be um, uh, too aggressive, mm -hmm. particularly with family. Well, you don't want to be aggressive with anybody, but particularly with family. They watch how you behave because they feel they know you inside and out. And it, it I, I remember my mother said, well, I knew Becky had been converted when she asked to do the dishes and it wasn't her turn, you know. <laughs> so that's the kind of things they're looking at, you know. My dad was, um, he was afraid I joined a cult. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got involved with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, when I went away, because, uh, you know, I became a Christian my last year of high school. Right. So I was 18, mm -hmm. went away to university and got involved with InterVarsity. And he was very worried that initially that I joined a cult. And uh, but then over time, as he watched and saw the tremendous difference it made in my life. And when my I'm the eldest of three. And when my brother and sister were in their teenage years and having typical teenage problems, <laughs> dad said to me, could you, do you think you could help them join that club you're in? <laughs> I said, Daddy, it's not a club. I believe in Jesus. He goes, whatever. But then is life got difficult. And I tell the story and out of the salt shaker, um, he, he had, had the very early stages of Alzheimer's and then full blown. Mm. And um, God literally, I, I, I was having a quiet time and the Lord's, and I had shared my faith many times, but I sense the Lord was saying, go now. Mm. And he was now in a re, uh, Alzheimer's unit, but he he was still it was the early stages, so he he could converse. Yeah. Anyway, I went and shared the gospel, and it, it, it's such a moving story. It'd take too long to do it now, but um, he absolutely received Christ. Mm. And the nurses told me later. In fact, it was very interesting. It, a little bit, I'd say about six months later, he really had gone to a point where he could have never sure. communicated mm, back. Mm. But the nurses said, what has happened to your dad? Wow. There is such a joy. There is such a peace. Mm. So, And an important lesson that 
we should never give up hope. Exactly. Exactly. I wish I could say that, oh, you know, he came to Christ because I was so mm, faithful. There mm. were so many years where I thought, oh, Dad, he's just, he's he'll, never, he'll never change. He'll never, change. He'll never <laughs> do it. Yeah. And uh, if we have time a little bit later as to why is evangelism so important, yeah. I want to share the last conversion of my family, which is my brother. Well, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Um, Becky, it's it's so good to hear your story and your personal engagement with evangelism, which I know has helped so many people, specifically because the first book you wrote was, I think, probably a very unexpected big success for you. Yes. Um, out of the salt shaker. <laughs> yes. tell, tell us about how, how you came to write this okay, book. Okay, so I now am at university and... Um, you know, had the university years, which were very rich, and particularly my year of studying in Spain. That's where I really began getting equipped. There, It is so important to give Christians training, and I had none. Mm. Well, the one Christian conference I went to my first year at university was the conference was a disaster for me right. because they were saying, don't waste time Try to lead somebody to Christ immediately. Don't get engaged in conversation. Preach the gospel, and if they're not interested, move on. Here are stock <laughs> phrases that you should always use. Right. And look at all questions as smoke screens. It me and I walked away, and I all and I was feeling very inadequate about sharing my mm. faith, and wasn't doing it a lot. I mm. be, I knew it was true, mm. and, and but but I had all the typical fears that every Christian has. Um, but when I went to this conference, I went, if that is what evangelism is, I I'm sunk because I can't do what they're saying. Yeah. It's not how you treat people. A, a kind of a prepackaged, treat people on a conveyor belt kind of Absolutely. Approach. Here's the formula. Memorize yeah. this yeah. technique and use it on one and all. What's mm. the problem with memorized techniques? One, you can only use it once. <laughs> You're talking to somebody. What are you going to do the second time? <laughs> can't say, by the way, did I happen to mention? Um, secondly... You don't have to depend upon God. I think that's the real reason we mm, use these mm. kind of formulas. It's not that we don't need practical help. We do. But it wasn't until I was a student in Spain, got involved with IFES, International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, and um, lived with the staff worker who was about 25 years older than me, one of the, the, the most gifted evangelists I mm, ever met. Mm. Uh, I got so much equipping, and it's what we need to do. By the way, I think the greatest weakness in the church and evangelism is that we aren't training people in personal evangelism in the right way. We can talk about mm. that later. So I um, I then did my master's. I'd done undergraduate and graduate work in English literature. I was just starting a Ph.D., Was about wanted to start one, an InterVarsity Christian Fellowship said, um, we really want you to um, join staff and do it, you know, for a couple of years. And we are assigning you Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Reed College is the uh, most academic university in America and the farthest from God. Th and that was exactly right. As I began doing these, what we call private, uh, I think you might call it public, but I did these... Um, you know, private academic universities as a staff worker helping students in evangelism, we just saw amazing fruit. And so when I finished, I did five years of staff. Uh, everybody was saying, Becky, you've got to write down what happened and start talking about this mm -hmm. way you're training people in evangelism, incarnational, relational, etc. And uh, so I wrote Out of the Salt Shaker. I wrote it yeah, I think I was 28 when I wrote the book, yeah. and never in a million years could I have imagined that it would still be out there, you know. So it was just an yeah. amazing experience. I mean, I, I've heard you, your book quoted in a church in Kampala, Uganda. Yeah. You know, the, the, it's gone everywhere. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's amazing, and, and I guess you're, you're still seeing the fruit of, of, of that. Yeah, it really is extraordinary. And that's what launched me in my evangelism ministry, because I'd been on InterVarsity staff, but I really wasn't sure. 
um, quite what God wanted me to do. And after the book came out, it was absolutely clear. Yeah, so yeah. that's what began the ministry. So this was a book very much that, that drew together your experience and, and what you'd learned in that time, um, specifically dealing very often with the fears commonly people have right. when it comes to evangelism. I think a lot of people, frankly, never get round to evangelism because they have a certain set of presuppositions about it. I I need to know everything there is to know about Christianity in case someone asks me a difficult question. Um, I, I, I can't do it. I'm I'm not gifted in that way or I'm not, you know, the right sort of person and, and so on. Um, so what are some of the typical fears that you identified then? And, yeah. and maybe we could talk about the kind of fears people They haven't face. changed. <laughs> That's the part that fascinates me. We did seven years of global ministry. Uh, went on every continent over and over again. Then the last seven years, we lived in the UK and ministered throughout Europe, throughout the UK, and only came back to America a year ago. And the thing that amazed me is everybody says the same thing, exactly what you just said. First, it is, um, uh, yeah, but I, I couldn't possibly evangelize because I'm so inadequate. I And, and I go, of course you're inadequate. <laughs> Everyone's inadequate. Isn't it freeing to know? It is, you know, recognizing our inadequacy, celebrating our inadequacy is the first qualification to being used by God in ministry. Mm. You have to recognize and not be ashamed. Celebrate your inadequacy. What does that do? It makes you lean upon the power of God. Mm. Who is adequate? Mm. In fact, the very first talk I give in our evangelism training is that God is glorified in human weakness. And and because that answers <laughs> the immediate thing, I can't do it. <laughs> Second thing I hear all the time, well, it's not my gift. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I just c couldn't do it. It's not my gift. And I go, well, now, wait a minute. It may be very true you haven't been gifted as an evangelist. Um, there, there aren't, you know, there's just a limited or, you know, some people have been gifted as, as an evangelist. That isn't the issue. The issue is that we're all called to be a witness, regardless of who we are. When Jesus was uh, uh, right before he ascended into heaven, what did he say? Here's what Christians behave like, he said. Go ye therefore, all ye extroverted Americans, <laughs> Uh, go ye therefore, all you with dynamic communication skills, and the rest of you, just hang out. Sing hymns. I'll be back. Yeah. I'll be back. That is not what the Lord said. Go ye therefore, all of you, without regard to gift, personality type, gender, culture, all of us are called to be witnesses. So the question isn't if, the question is only how. One of the things I hear all the time is, oh, I couldn't possibly do it. What if I'm, what if I offend them? I say it's a very, very legitimate fear. But let me tell you something. You know, when I'm doing training conferences, I always say, how many of you have really wanted to share the Lord and really wanted to share the gospel? And then you hesitated because you were so afraid you'd offend. Every hand goes up every time. Then I say, how many of you have said to that person, you know, I really am excited about being a Christian, but I'm so afraid I'm going to turn you off. I hesitate. Now, how many of you have said that? Two hands go up. And I go, why didn't you realize you could just be yourself? Mm -hmm. What could be no more normal than saying to your friend, you know, um, I really do love the Lord, but I don't like Bible bashers. <laughs> and I'm so afraid if I say something, I'm going to offend you. So if if I come on too strong, would you let me know? Now, what does that say? We're normal. Yes. It mm. establishes mm. commonality. Yeah. Uh, people are afraid of being rejected. Well, Sometimes we will be rejected, and sometimes it isn't our fault. Mm. There's a conviction mm. that they are having about God, and they don't want to respond. We get the mm. bullets because they can see us. Yeah. Uh, and it's not pleasant, but we have to be able mm. to, to say, you know, 
There are Christians around the world who are dying and imprisoned. What are, what is the problem with us in the West? Oh, they raised an eyebrow. <laughs> oh, they may think I'm dumb. We got to get over uh, Our level of comfort is significantly different to, to other Christians, oh, isn't it? Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So again, one of the things that's important in training, deal with mm, these fears, mm. uh, because there really are some good answers to them. Uh, and, and what about the fear, just before we go to our break, Becky, what if they ask me a difficult question and I don't know the answer? Absolutely. And people ask me all the time questions. And sometimes I know, and by the way, we need to keep reading apologetics. Mm, mm. I'm so grateful that is a passion of yours because really there's about 10 questions people mm, tend to ask. Mm. All right, read about it and even put it in a three by five card, you know, um, just the basic yeah. arguments, mm. you know. But. What if you genuinely don't know the answer? What I say is that is a fantastic question. Now, very important to do that. You affirm the question. And I don't know, but I can't wait to find out. I am so glad God has brought you into my life to sharpen me yeah. so I can learn. Then all of a sudden, the unbeliever goes, one, they're real, they're authentic, yeah. they're honest. And two, the question they can't answer doesn't seem to diminish their faith. Yes. And often the question takes on a little less significance, but you still try to find the answer. And you leave the, the door open for the conversation to continue. Exactly. Yeah. Great exactly. stuff. Becky, I'm loving talking to you. We're going to continue talking about some of your more recent uh, resources and, and uh, DVDs and Seeker Bible Study Guides and so on in a moment's time. And I want to hear more stories about your personal encounters. You've got uh, an interesting one to tell me about uh, a man you met on a plane recently as well, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. But uh, you're listening to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio. I'm Justin Briley, your host for the show that brings you an interesting person from some walk of uh, Christian life. And uh, today it's Becky Pippert, international speaker, author and evangelist, who best known probably for her book that really made waves uh, out of the salt shaker into the world. And we're talking about her continuing ministry both here in Europe and in the USA. Uh, don't forget that you can hear more interesting interviews with all kinds of different people from Premier Christianity magazine. Go to the website premierchristianity.com and do join us again in a few minutes' time as we continue this conversation with Becky Pippert. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Well, welcome back to the second part of today's program. I'm Justin Briley, and on the profile today, I'm joined by Becky Pippert, international speaker, author, and evangelist, who for decades has been helping Christians find the confidence to share their faith effectively. Her book, Out of the Salt Shaker into the World, was an international bestseller when she wrote it, just in her late 20s. And since then, she's raised a family, established an evangelistic ministry in Europe, and continues to write and produce resources. We're going to be talking about some of the most recent ones, uh, things like the Live, Grow, Know resource, uh, Empowered, her Seeker Bible Study Guides, and much more besides. Um, uh, so uh, we're, this is the program where if you want to hear an interesting conversation week by week with a significant Christian, all kinds of different people we feature on the profile. Uh, and I'm glad you found us this Saturday afternoon. Uh, don't forget you can read more interviews in the magazine. I'm the editor of the mag, and uh, you can find that at premierchristianity.com slash free sample if you want to ask for a free sample copy of the magazine. I've been really enjoying this conversation with you, Becky, because uh, I, I'm passionate about evangelism too. Mm -hmm. And um, not everyone, I think, gets the bug, though, for evangelism. Yeah. They, they, they have all these fears and things that, that stop yeah. them doing that. And, and in a way, your work has been very much about releasing people from those fears and mm. making them feel confident mm. to, to be able to share their faith from, from where they are. Um, you, you know, had written this amazing book, and then you went on to raise a family. And obviously that became your, your primary focus for a number of years. That's right. The nature of my work is has been an itinerant evangelist. It's twofold. It's an evangelism trainer and then doing outreach. Mm. You can't keep that level of travel and raise children. No. And so what I did is that's when I started writing other books, did sort of the apologetic books, mm. Hope Has Its Reasons, A Heart for God on looking at how does God meet us in suffering, wrote Bible studies and that kind of thing. And I certainly had ministry where I was living, but um, I, I, the, the travel just, it wasn't possible. I would do one conference a month. That's about what I would do. Mm. 
And um, but then the last child left, you know, for university. And my husband, Dick, said to me, you know, Becky, I re he was a businessman, had a business. And he said, I really feel yeah, that God has been speaking to me and that I need to sell the business. We need to do ministry together. I, I know that you need to get back as a traveling evangelistic uh, trainer and an evangelist. And I, I'm, I really think we should do it. So we did. Mm. And never dreaming, one, all the opportunities in America, because in the training aspect, I've said this before, it tends to be our weakest love aspect of evangelism mm. because most people are non-evangelists mm -hmm. so uh how do we equip them how do we help them but then what we didn't expect was the global uh response and then we started traveling all over the world then we ended up uh coming to the uk we'd always be home for christmas always home for mm -hmm. the summer but it was a lot of travel yeah what what were some of the lessons you picked up obviously cross-culturally by spending quite a bit of time in the UK. Um, did that kind of change significantly the way you thought about and approached evangelism? Now, we had done a lot of work in the West. I had already been to the UK so much, though it was different living here. Mm. Um, Australia, America. And I would say that the um, the times have changed, that, that there is a, a greater difficulty in some ways, in terms of, of the gospel, people's openness to the gospel. Mm. But it's twofold. Um, people are more hostile, mm -hmm. and they are more hungry. And I think they're hungry because of the emptiness right. of, of, the, of the secular message. Um, advanced modernity has produced some lethal distortions. Certainly, the sexual revolution is one. Um, uh, preference, it's always preference over any truth claim. Yeah. That is enormous in our culture. Uh, this pick and choose, you see this so much in the States that it is, well, I'll take a little of this and a little of that mm. cafeteria style, but I'm the one who is going to determine what I sure. want to put together. Mm. Certainly the issue of science is buried God. Yeah. So all of, you know, many, many more, but that is a problem. Nevertheless, I think the hunger is, is even greater. I think you're absolutely right. I think you've 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 hit the nail on the head there. Just because people are less open in some ways to the gospel doesn't right. mean that they're not trying to fill that gap with all kinds exactly. of other things. Exactly. Exactly. And often finding that the what materialist secular culture offers them is is like fast food. You know, it, yeah. it, it may, maybe it satisfies for a little bit, but it doesn't go deep down. Absolutely. Do you know? I you were asking of the difference between the UK and America. Um, the UK, Europe, has been secular for so long. Mm. You've been marinating in this secularism <laughs> for a very long time. Yes, I know what you mean. It has come to America, but it's newer. Mm. You know, America used to be much more of a religious culture. It's less now, but and and even in the states, you don't assume that anyone would have an understanding of of things like or have even heard of creation, the fall, mm, redemption, mm, you know. Mm. Um, nevertheless, it's different. Yeah. Um, for instance, you don't, uh, the percentage of people who call themselves atheists is very small compared to Europe, uh, to, compared to the UK. Um, it, they just did a study about this in the US, and it really was interesting how, how, even though they didn't label themselves Christians, they didn't label themselves atheists either. Yeah. What I hear all the time, I was just on a national radio show in America, and now, <laughs> you see, I think it's clergy, and I think it's leaders that assume they don't want help. So I'm on this national, very famous radio show with Collins, and they say, now listen, Becky, you've been out of the country for quite a while, so don't be surprised that nobody will call in. <laughs> because frankly, personal evangelism is a little outdated. It's mm. considered quite old-fashioned. Okay. Um, if it's... Um, they, they'd be very interested in justice. They wouldn't be so interested right. in that. 
the phone lines lit up yeah. immediately when the, mm. the interview mm. started. Mm. And every single line was lit. Yeah. And all the questions were, I just need help. I'm not getting anything. Mm. I need to know. How do you even raise the topic mm. of faith? Mm. What do I do with mm. my fears? How do you go from a natural conversation to a spiritual one? How do you give the gospel? <laughs> How do I share my testimony? Everything we do in our yeah, training. Yeah, yeah. So I'm on this flight. And interestingly, it was Aka who had come to do a mission in Arizona State. This is the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. Yes, RZIM, Ravi Mm. Zacharias Ministry. And so they said, because we've worked together a lot, they said, would you come and do the evangelism training? Then we'll come and do the mission, and we Mm. work together. Okay. I said to the Lord as I got on the flight, I said, Lord, it's so discouraging. I'm hearing so many people say in leadership, the light's gone out for evangelism, and there just isn't an interest. The culture's so difficult. And I said, I I know people are hungry. Would you just help me? I need encouragement Mm. to know. I get on the plane. I sit down and listen to the man next to me who is a Londoner. I mean, so clear. He was a (laughs) Londoner. Reserved, plummy kind of accent. (laughs) And... um, and clearly didn't really want to talk. I mean, he, he was just so clear. I'm reserved. Yeah, yeah, I'm busy. Yeah. You know. So a little bit into the flight, I said, by the way, it's always such fun for me to sit next to a Londoner. He said, how did you know I'm from London? <laughs> Americans never could identify that. I said, I lived in the UK for seven years. And he said, that's so interesting because I'm living in America. And not not as many as some. Well, no, no. He had been living in America for eight years. Mm. And he said, let's compare notes. <laughs> so what's the first principle there? Common ground. Yeah. You, find, you don't rush in to give the gospel. <laughs> yeah. You get to know them. Mm. So we talked for a long time. My impressions of the UK, his impressions of America. We had a delightful conversation. He was fascinated by it. Then he said, why are you flying to Arizona? I said, well, I write books and I lecture on my books. I'm going to be speaking on my books. He said, well, what are your books about? I said, well, my books are about the Christian faith. So I'm speaking about a Christian conference. He said, I'm an agnostic. I have no interest whatsoever in spiritual conversation. I said, that is so interesting because I was an agnostic. And I'm just curious if your reasons for not wanting to talk about faith were the same as my reasons. Now, there's a point here. And that is, just be, don't get intimidated when somebody goes not interested at all. Test the grounds a little bit. Yeah. And that, you know, now if he said in in response, I am not interested, I wouldn't have pursued it. You don't violate someone's space. But when I said, oh my goodness, we have something in common. We're both agnostics. I wonder if your reasons are the same as mine. He said, well, okay, Becky, for example, how can you? He said, I can tell you're a thinking person because we've been talking. How can you possibly believe in a faith where we don't even know if Jesus existed? And I said, well, do you really want an answer to that? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, let's just look at, you know, some historians at the time of Jesus that wrote about this. So, you know, mentioned um, Tacitus, the Roman historian, Josephus, the Jewish historian, uh, Emperor Trajan's nephew, Pliny, in about 112 AD. And he went, huh, that's impressive. He said, okay, I didn't know that. All right, but then how can you believe the Bible? It's just a propaganda piece. How could you possibly believe it's historically reliable? So I went through just very quickly Mm. sort of five basic Mm. tenets Mm. of how you determine if any historical document is reliable. And he said, I can't believe we are having a rational conversation (laughs) about faith. He said, I've had a couple um, of American Christians who've tried to, you know, talk to me about faith. Mm. and, And it's... I say, but I need something for my head. They keep saying it's just an experience in your heart. And he Mm. said, but I have a head. What am Mm. I supposed to do? Mm. He said, you know, they've wanted to do something I haven't allowed them to do, but I'm going to ask you to do. (laughs) Would you tell me what is the essence of the Christian message and how did you become a Christian? Now, as he says this, oh my gosh, you pay big money to get somebody (laughs) to say that. But I can hear the wheels coming down on the plane. And I thought, oh my gosh, how do I tell the answer in a minute? and the gospel in two or three. Mm. And that's another point. Mm. You need to know how to explain the gospel in a very short way and then in a more thoughtful, longer way. You Mm. also need to know how to share your story. I told him, 
Now we're on the ground. And he said, Becky, do you have any books I could read that are on evidence? And I you know, mentioned Ravi yeah. and Os Guinness and different people, John Lennox. But I said, I actually wrote a book that deals with trying to help non-Christians know if it's true. It's called Hope Has Its Reasons. He goes, I want to start with you because I know you. Would you send me your book? I said, I will. But let me ask you something. You're really bright. You're really well read. But I sort of have the impression that you've never actually looked at the primary source material. And he said, well, how can I do that if I didn't think it was historically reliable? I said, yeah, but look, if you were going to find out about, uh, you know, Mao and and his beliefs, you'd have to read the Red Book. It doesn't mean Mm. that you have to believe it's true, Mm. Mm. but you can't make an intelligent decision until you look at it. And I said, I've written books for unbelievers who need to find out about Jesus and that that are curious about Jesus have never read it. It's seven passages. I'm going to send that to you and I really want you to look at it. He said, I would love to do that. And point taken, by the way, that as a mm-hmm. intellectual, mm-hmm. I should have been willing to look at least at what it says. So um, we get off the plane, we're walking to our bags and he said, there's something I've got to tell you. He said, uh, a few years ago, my wife became a Christian. And he said, you can't imagine the shock waves I went through. But he said, I love her. We have a good marriage. And I gave permission. She takes our three children uh, to church. But Becky, my eldest son, who's seven, says, Daddy, why don't you go to church with us? Don't you believe in Jesus? Why don't you pray before our meals? He said, Becky, it haunts me. Mm. Now, Who was this man three hours earlier? I have no interest whatsoever (laughs) in talking about faith. So one, never judge a book by its cover. Mm. Don't assume they're not interested. Be able to answer questions that may come up and know how not only to share the gospel, but get them encountering Jesus. And and that comes as it did for you by going to the source material, as you say. Exactly. Finding Jesus in the pages of Scripture. And that's very much where you focused a lot of your energy with the Seeker Bible studies. Yes. Um, tell, tell me about why it's so important for you to get people who may be very skeptical actually engaging with Jesus first and foremost. Okay. All right. Now, by the way, forgot to tell you that I am now emailing in correspondence with a guy in the oh, plane. Brilliant. Oh, that's Send wonderful. him the stuff. He now says, let's talk about faith. <laughs> All right. Here's the thing that's important to understand. Where do you begin in evangelism? You begin in prayer. And you need to ask God, to open my eyes. And look in your world. You don't mm. have to go out to, mm. you know, uh, 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 another country to be mm. a witness. You start right where we are, you are. So you ask God at my workplace, if you're a student, in my classes, in my dorm, in my neighborhood, and in my extended family. Lord, who are you working in already? God's already there. And you've got to ask him, who's open? Mm. And then you need to throw out the bait. Jesus said we're to be fishers of men, not hunters of men. So you throw out the bait, you get to know uh, you see who you click with. So now you're in a relationship with this person. What do you do? You ask questions like I did. You find common ground like I did with a Londoner. You ask questions. You find out what are their points of resistance to the Christian faith. Then, as you have been developing a relationship, uh, they know you really care about them, that you really have compassion for them, that they're not just an evangelistic project. Mm-hmm. You're not going to drop them if they don't become a Christian. But then you say, at some point, could I share with you just the essence of what I think Christianity is about? That's one thing. But the other is saying exactly what I've already said. You're really bright. But it seems like you've never read much of the Bible as an adult. Mm. Would you, what would you think about just taking a look at some of the Bible stories of Jesus? Just try it once. Give it a go. Mm. If it's Mm. not your cup of tea, Mm. don't worry about Mm. it. But let's just do it once. Now, why is a seeker Bible study so Mm. powerful? Jesus is irresistible. It's exactly my aunt's story. (laughs) Is that when I started reading the Gospels, I had no idea. He's so beautiful. He's so controversial. He's so different than what anybody thinks. And what I have seen, I train people. Uh, in in seeker Bible studies here in England, in Europe, all over the world, China, everyone keeps saying, 
I can't believe how Jesus comes alive. And non-believers come, mm. and they begin responding to wow. Jesus. And yeah. they've seen so many people yeah. come to faith. Well, I should make mention that um, Becky's uh, Seeker Bible Study Guides are available from the website beckypippet.com, as well as a number of other um, things you've produced. Uh, Empowered is a training course, a DVD-based course um, in evangelism. And there's the Live, Grow, Know um, resource. Tell us a little bit about that. That's more of a, a discipleship course. Isn't That's it? right. We saw so many people come to Christ when we were in the UK that I was asked, we need a good discipleship course you know, a DVD and a a Bible study thing. So it's live is for the person who's just come to Christ. Grow is to equip the Christian. Know is sort of to to deepen, Mm because I look at five Mm -hmm. doctrines. One of the things I'm the most excited about is empowered. Um, What is it? It's uh, DVDs over and and Bible studies over a seven-week period that the churches can use to equip people in personal evangelism. All the things I've been talking about, but I'm inadequate. What what do I do? You know, uh, um, what about my fears? How do I arouse, how do I rouse curiosity? How do I even go from a natural conversation to a spiritual one? How do I explain the gospel? How do I lead a seeker Bible study? How do I lead someone to Christ? What we filmed was our entire evangelism training program. Mm. And there are three things that, that pastors need to understand if they want their churches to be effective. One, it begins with personal evangelism, and they have to equip. By and large, the majority of their parishioners are non-evangelists. Mm-hmm. They need to do that. They need small group evangelism. They need to do seeker studies, I think, first, and then follow it with Alpha or mm-hmm. Christianity mm-hmm. Explored. Um, but you need first to have a dialogical small group encounter with the person of Jesus. Personal, small group, and then proclamation, evangelistic wow. outreach. All three, but they need equipping and personal. It's been great for you to share just some of the accumulated experience you've had. So many more questions that we haven't had time for on today's program. But um, you did give us a little flavor of um, what had happened in your family as, as you had an influence and, a, and an opportunity to tell them about Christ. Um you said one of the most interesting stories was your brother, though. Ah, yes. Can you can you bring us back to that? Okay. I'm often asked, Becky, why is evangelism so important? And I say, well, first, because God sent his son to die. Uh, that's a pretty good reason of why God feels it's so important, because mm. he loves the lost, mm. and so must we. But the second thing of why it's so important is it is truly life and death. It really mm. makes that big of difference. Now, my brother, I adored him. He's uh, my only brother. He had a very colorful life, mm. very far from the kingdom. We were very close. He loved me. He admired me so much, but but very, very far from the kingdom. One day, the first three years of our seven years in the UK, we lived in Belfast, and he calls me in Belfast, and he said, Oh, Becky. Now, he's now at that point 60. And he said, I have so many regrets. I have so many regrets. And we call him Bobby. And I said, Bobby, that's wonderful. I said, because the gospel doesn't make any sense if you don't have regrets. It literally can't work Mm. if you don't have regrets. Because all of us have sinned. Mm. All of us. He goes, oh, but Becky, Mm. I look at your life and here you are, this Christian evangelist. You know what I've done in my life. I said, Bob, do you know the thing we have in common, though? I said, yes, our lives have been quite different. But we both sent Jesus to the cross. So what difference at the end of the day, Mm. the fact that all of our sins sent Jesus to the cross? I said, Bob, you just have to come. You know, without apology, own what you have such regret about, about and then let Jesus come and and fill you and fill you with the Holy Spirit. And went over the gospel very briefly, but I'd done it so many times, yeah. he knew it. And he said, oh, Becky, thank you. Well, now, I probably about a month later, we're in church at our church in Belfast, and I had this overwhelming sense that God was saying, I want you to gather your family for Thanksgiving. Now, this is the second year we were in the UK. And when we realized this was a call, we weren't just going to come for a year. But the response was Mm -hmm. was so incredible. 
we sold our home. And so we didn't have a house mm-hmm. to go to in those mm-hmm. seven years. Mm-hmm. We'd always go to uh, my mother-in-law's. And, and the kids would come and visit us yeah. there, and we'd go to them. And I said to Dick afterwards, I said, I really have the sense. Lord wants us to gather the family for Thanksgiving. And he said, well, did God say where? And I said, we didn't get that far. <laughs> and he said, well, do you think we should start finding a place? I said, no, if this, you always test guidance. And I said, if this is of God, it, it'll it'll provide. God will provide. A mm-hmm. week later, I get an email from a friend saying, you know, I was thinking about how you, she gets our prayer letters. And she said, the fact that you're, um, you, you know, you sold your home so you can do ministry there. And she said, so I was thinking, boy, it must be hard when you're gathering the kids together, uh, adult children. She said, I am, we're always gone for Thanksgiving. They live in Chicago. And they, they said, she said, what would you think if you just used our house for Thanksgiving? The very thing mm, I had said mm, to Dick, mm. wrote all my family, my brother, my sister, my mom. I said, everybody come. We'll do the cooking mm-hmm. and, uh, and and bring as many kids as you can. Brilliant. In walks my brother. And I took one look at him and I went, oh, my gosh, he looks so different. There, uh, there's such a joy, such a peace. And Dick and I talked about it that night. And he said, something's different with Bob. I said, oh, I know it. So... But it was so many people, and it was so busy, we never had a chance to talk. And so he left. Everybody left on Saturday. And we found something he had left. So I called him and said, Bobby, it's just a little thing. But he goes, no, no, I really want it. So he comes back, sits down, and he said, I want to tell you what's happened to me. And he said, Becky, after we talked and there wasn't an ounce of judgment, you were saying it was wonderful news that I had such regrets I did pray. And I, Becky, if I could tell you what has happened in my life, the answers to prayer, I never imagined that Jesus could make this difference. He left, and I said to Dick, for the first time in my life, I know my brother is truly saved. Mm -hmm. I can't believe it. Five days later, and it's hard to talk about this, Mm -hmm. he was killed in a car crash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, my goodness. That's why the Lord spoke to me in church, Mm. because he knew what was coming. He knew how Mm. devastated the family would be. Mm. He knew we needed to see Bobby one more time, but he also Mm. knew the grace that would fill us to know Mm. that we know where he is. Mm. I know Mm. where my brother is. Do you know what that means Mm. to me? It's life and death. It's that important. Becky, thank you for sharing from the heart, um, from your experience, and just for the encouragement you've given as well, me and I'm sure many people listening. Thank uh, you so much. When it comes to what they can do with what they have. Um, Becky Pippett has joined me for this edition of The Profile. If you want to find out more about her, I do encourage you to go to her website, beckypippett.com. And Becky, I hope we'll see you again in the UK before too long. Absolutely. We are coming back and I can't wait. We've missed it so much. <laughs> well, I, I've already said uh, I must get you along to my own uh, evangelism and apologetics conference at some point. That would be, would love would be to. wonderful. But uh, for the moment, thank you for joining me on the program today. And thank you for listening. And if you'd like to hear this interview again, why not go online? Uh, premierchristianradio.com slash the profile to listen back to today's episode and indeed to many of the other conversations we have here on the program and if you'd like to read more interesting interviews with people from all walks of life do go to the website of premier christianity magazine i'm justin briley the senior editor and if you want to uh, find a free sample copy uh, get it delivered to you absolutely free uh, go to the link there to premier christianity dot com slash free sample for the moment thank you for joining me on this week's edition of the program keep listening dave rose is here next with premier playback